Good evening, everybody. Hi. Hi, hello, good evening. My name is Ray Andrade. I am the programming librarian here at LMU's library. On behalf of the entire library staff, I did want to give you all a jolly welcome to today's special faculty pub night event. And I say special because for tonight's event, we don't have one, but we have a, at least a couple of presenters for tonight who are gonna be talking about a collaborative documentary project entitled The Magic Chair. So for tonight, one of our presenters is Dr. Rebecca Stevenson. She serves as the editorial manager for the Journal of Catholic Education and lecturer at LMU School of Education. Um, unfortunately, a second presenter was not able to join us today. This would be Dr. Victoria Groff, professor of elementary and secondary education also at LMU School of Education. However, we do have our third presenter with us today. This is, Dr. This is professor, Associate Professor Gregory Rosen, who also, also serves as Associate Dean of Academic Affairs at the School of Film and Television. Um, so for tonight, before we begin the actual event, just a couple of quick words about Faculty Pub Night. I know it sounds that it's faculty only, but it is not. So students, congratulations on finding, about, finding out about this event. Please spread the word. So it is not for faculty only, and yes, it is a pub, but it is not 21 and over. Our good friend Eric, the bartender, will be checking IDs. So anybody under 21, please do not try to be slick, okay? <laughs> but by all means, it's a casual event, so please feel free to grab some food and some drinks at any point during the program. Um, another word is, on your chairs, you should see a small feedback form that is modeled by the Dean of the Library, Chris Francolini. Thank you, Dean Francolini. <laughs> If you fill out those forms and if you include your email address, you will be entered into a raffle for a $100 Amazon gift card as well. So at the conclusion of the event, you could drop off those feedback forms into that plastic box on the counter. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> and also, if any students did not get a chance to swipe in to Leo, AKA OrgSync, please let the staff know and we'll make sure that you get credit for attending today's event. So without further ado, I would like to welcome to the, to the podium Brian Katowski, who is an alumnus of the School of Film and Television, now also a lecturer at the School of Film and Television. And he's, he's, his proud claim to fame is he's the film editor for the Magic Chair documentary. So please welcome Brian. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Brian Katowski, and I'm an instructor in the School of Film and Television. And I'm going to take a moment to introduce our speaker for the evening, Gregory Rosen. Uh, Greg's an award-winning filmmaker, a uh, beloved teacher in the School of Film and Television, and the Associate Dean in the School of Film and Television. I first met Greg in January of 2004, uh, during my second semester of graduate school here at LMU. His class was a production class, meaning that the class itself was centered around making a short film uh, which most of us did not know just how much work that was going to be. <laughs> uh, what immediately became apparent about Greg was that he had a very dry wit, an extremely eclectic taste in socks and hats, <laughs> that he would expect a lot from his students, and he had a great creative mind. His insights and coaching would lead everyone to make better films, grow as filmmakers, and create new and exciting product. He was tough but fair, and we all appreciated how he balanced holding us accountable for the goals of the class, while at the same time giving us the tools that we needed to meet those expectations. The experience was good enough that when it came time to do my senior thesis, I opted to take another class with Greg. And this was a year-long intensive program uh, in filmmaking. During that time, I was introduced to another side of Greg, which is just how caring of an individual he is. He spent many hours outside of class working with students on production, pre-production, and post-production. It was not uncommon during any hour of the day to walk through the basement of the School of Film and Television and see Greg working with a student. He has a very unique talent for seeing people's strengths and helping them identify their weaknesses and then using those strengths to counter the weakness. If you are a great cinematographer, he'll use that to help make you a better director. If you're a great writer, 
he'll help you learn to be a better editor. And he approaches all of his students on their level, identifying their different needs and teaching to those needs as they require. I've been working for over a decade as a film editor, and I credit most of that to the time I spent with Greg in the edit room, where he would teach me how much one or two frames matter, how to keep action moving, and how to let go of the pieces that aren't working. His mentorship gave me and many other students the knowledge that we needed to build careers in our respective fields. Greg doesn't just teach from a lesson plan. Often we would wonder if he even had a lesson plan. <laughs> <laughs> but he teaches the whole student. <laughs> he teaches the whole student and he helps them develop their own instincts and intuition. After graduation, Greg continued to function as a mentor for me, taking time to talk to me uh, and with me as my career had its own ups and downs. Uh, more often than not, I'd call him during a down and ask for advice. And Greg always has a way of kind of getting you to turn your viewpoint on a matter. And instead of looking at something that you think is an extreme problem, look at it as a potential to better yourself or move in a new direction. He's an eternal optimist, and not one through platitudes, but with constructive motivation and insight. He sees possibility in all things. He sees hope everywhere he turns. A few, lays, a few years later, Greg made his first documentary called Lost Child. The film chronicled his sister Alyssa's struggle with a severe cognitive disorder and how he struggled to regain his connection with her after decades of living on other uh, separate sides of the country. It was then that I saw Greg's tenderness and his ability to wear his heart on his sleeve with dignity, which I think is the truth of him as a filmmaker. His heart and his passion rests in every frame that he puts on the screen. In the summer of 2015, Greg asked me to have lunch with him to discuss this project, uh, a, a, small, a small documentary <laughs> about a small school in Dublin, Ireland, and the amazing teachers that work there with students that most people had given up on. We've been working on the film since then and are happy to be seeing it come very close to completion. He still teaches me and now he kind of mentors me on new things, such as being a good father, being a good husband, being a good teacher, and being a good man. And tonight he's here to speak to you about the film and the ongoing uh, transmedia projects that it has spawned. I suppose there is no better person to tell the story of children that everyone has given up on and finding potential where everyone sees a problem than the man who sees hope and promise in everyone. So please welcome the Associate Deans of the School of Film and Television and my teacher, mentor, colleague, and friend, Greg Rosen. some high words, high words to live up to, Brian, but um, I would say thank you very much, and thank you for that introduction. I, I, you know, Brian has been a student and now a friend for a long time. I hadn't realized it was 2004. Um, doesn't feel like it's been that long. I don't think I'm that old, but thank you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so we're here tonight to talk about the magic chair, and I have my colleague Becky Stevenson here from the School of Ed who we're going to be working with on and doing this presentation. And at one point here, I'm going to ask Brian to come back up to the table. Here, let me give you one of these. Here, you take this one. Okay. Okay. Well, I learned that in my first day of film school. <laughs> okay, so we're good. Um, yeah, so Becky and I are going to walk through this uh, presentation with you, and at some point we're going to invite Brian to come back up and talk to us about the process of editing a documentary. Because as he said, he called it a little, a small documentary, but, but I don't think any documentary is really small. What I've learned in the last, uh, so I, I'm relative new, neophyte to the, to the documentary world. Um, they are so much more difficult to make than fiction films. And they're <laughs> so, much, so much more challenging, and, and I would say more rewarding in some ways. So tonight's presentation that we're going to talk about, I'm going to move the little mouse so that thing goes away. This drives me nuts. 
But what we're calling this project is, oh, let's get here. Oh. so this presentation Becky and I and Brian have put together is the magic chair on the difficulties of launching a transmedia project <laughs> while working in higher ed. <laughs> And the reason we titled it that is because all three of us, and for the last couple of years, Brian has been very instrumental in this process as well. We all have full-time jobs. You know, we teach, we have things going on. And so finding, finding time to sort of weave this massive project into our lives has been a big challenge. And that's one of the reasons why it has taken quite a long time to uh, get this project going. So Becky and I, we were talking about how do we organize this, this presentation, and she says, Brian was with us. She said, well, what about a timeline? Now, timelines are something we work with all the time in the School of Film and Television and in editing, right? Timeline on a computer is beginning to end of the film. But we were like, well, what about the timeline of this project? So we thought, yeah, maybe that's a good idea. <laughs> and the first year we're going to put up um, is 2009. So we'll be back to that in a moment. Because it's, we've already been working on this in some ways since 2009. But before we start, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the whole project and give you a little sense of our context and our goals with the project. So I'm going to play a little video next. And this is just a minute long. And let's see, how do we do that? It's there. Oh, now I use the mouse. Okay. You'd think I never use technology, right? But I do every day. Did you know that more than a billion people live with a disability? That's one and a half times the population of Europe and more than three times that of the US. If one in seven people live with a disability, chances are you know and love one of them. Perhaps a coworker, a friend, daughters, sons, or you. Now imagine being told you're a daffodil that will never bloom, that because of your special needs, the world will do little or nothing to help you grow, nothing to help you learn, nothing to help you thrive. This is the message that nearly a billion people, 15% of the world's population, are given every day. The magic chair will change this, one story at a time, by empowering the largest minority on the planet to tell their own stories and inspire the world. Now that's a little video we put together. One of the things you do when you try to raise money to make a documentary <laughs> is you submit your project to all kinds of organizations and, and different, um, I'll go back to that, we'll leave that down for a second. And so that was a video we put together, we were tasked with putting together a one minute teaser for a, we applied to the Sheffield Film Festival in Europe has a really great documentary um, pitching contest and so you have to submit one minute proposal. So we put that together, didn't get accepted. But that's okay, now we have it to use for other things. So, but those were some astounding numbers. And when I first got involved in this project, as Brian mentioned in my intro, I do have a sister who has a cognitive disability. So I was aware of you know, the disabilities in the world, had a sense of how many people maybe are grappling with them. But then when I started doing research, the fact that fully 15% of the world's population deal with some kind of disability. And the fact that it's maybe the only disability or the only minority that many of us may join during the course of our lives, it really started to take on a different dimension for me when you think about those numbers. And so and that just sets up a little bit about what the Magic Chair is about, because the original impulse was to make a film, but it has become a much larger project as we've gone through the process. And that's what we'll talk a bit about tonight, is how it grew from just being a film to being much more than that. Uh, so who are we? Uh, we have a team of five people working on the project right now, and unfortunately only three of us are able to be here with you. That's me on the left with my penchant for funny hats. I didn't realize that went back to 2004. The socks, though, are still, I have ninja socks on today. I'm still holding true to the funny sock thing uh, and funny hats. Uh, Becky and then Brian, and then up on the upper right is Vicki Graff, Professor Vicki Graff. I think a lot of you guys know she's in Ireland now, but we're going to hear from her in just a moment. And then uh, down below is Bella Gildnaz she just she has a new name, but she just got married, Bella Gildnazarian, who uh, her last name is now, oh, I know because it's a famous cyclist's last name, uh, Vinokurov. So she's now Bella Vinokurov, and uh, she's been my RAINS research assistant. She worked with me for three years as a RAINS assistant on this project and graduated last year, but she's still working with us. Unfortunately, she can't be here tonight because she just has some younger siblings who she has to watch tonight, so she couldn't be here. So that's who we are, and the five of us have been working for a number of years now on this project. 
Um, before we get started a little more, we want to do something called a think and do, which is something that my friend Becky over here is very, <laughs> very good at and excited about. So I'm going to turn it over to her and, and uh, she's going to give you some instructions and when you tell me when we're ready, we'll advance to the next slide. Okay. Hi. Um, so one of the things that we're trying to do with the project is give people opportunities to put themselves in other people's shoes. Um, so we've been talking a lot about simulations and ways that you can grow empathy. Um, by kind of thinking about other people, but also feeling and experiencing what other people do. So that's what we're going to do tonight. Um, so I'm first going to pass out my um, instruments to my team. Do I get the tambourine? Okay. Brian, you want the bongo? Okay. Um, this is a very important part of the process. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we'll go to the next slide. And here's your task. Um, on this next slide are um, a bunch of words. I don't want you to read the words. I want you to tell me what color the words are written in. Okay? Don't read the words. Tell me what color they're written in. I think it's going to be easy for all of you except you in the back row um, because I know you can't do this. Okay? Um, and then ignore us. We're just going to play some music while you do this. We're going to read them all together, all out loud. <laughs> Um, and we'll switch to the next slide, and then I'll tell you when to go. Okay, go ahead. Remember, tell me what color the words are. Anybody else do it without making a mistake? Good. Um, anybody find this difficult? Yeah. What was difficult about it? The instruments. What else? Doing it all together. Okay. There was a lot of sensory input. There was audio input, and then the visual cues mm -hmm. were not actually cues. You had to override that. So okay. there was a lot of brain work for. <laughs> okay, so some fatigue there too. Anything else yes. you found difficult? Yeah, the yeah. The, the words were telling you something different from, but along the same dimension as the thing you were trying to figure out. Exactly, exactly. So this is a simulation, sort of, of what um, a child who has uh, maybe ADHD or autism or who has some other type of learning disability might experience in a classroom being asked to read aloud in the classroom. And like the key component is that what you see is not what your brain is telling you you see. And there's a disconnect there. Um, it's frustrating. It's kind of embarrassing when you make a mistake kind of you know, out in public. Um, and it's really not something that is your fault in any way, right? I gave you this impossible task. You have people walking around with crazy instruments um, trying to distract you. Um, so, we do a lot of these types of simulations, and we actually have some wonderful students working on virtual reality simulations for us now. Um, but this is one of the things that we're trying to do to help people understand and feel empathetic towards, uh, towards other people. Anybody have students in classes that kind of struggle with learning disabilities or attention issues? Um, maybe now you feel like one toe in their shoe, right? Um, hopefully they don't have big instruments going on <laughs> all the time. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks for playing along. Okay, thank you, Becky. So yeah, so simulation exercises, sometimes we call, I call them games. Vicky, our partner, always calls them simulation exercises, but it's, they have a checkered history in, in the disability realm, right? And so there's something we are grappling with a bit through the project. So um, this is the first year, 2009, so the timeline of the project essentially what happened back in 2009, you're going to hear it from somebody who was there. Essentially, St. Declan's was discovered by LMU and by our team, right? So this is a picture of the school. All the photos that you're going to see throughout the presentation came from the school in Ireland and are pulled from the footage that we have for the film, right? So all these images are of St. Declan's school and the children who are featured in the film. Um, it was in 2009 that uh, Professor Vicki Graff first stumbled upon the school, and we're going to hear from her 
right now. She's going to tell us a little bit about how uh, she came across the school and what the goals are for this project. How many of you know Vicki? Show of hands. Quite a few of us, yeah. She's a real, she's a force of nature, somebody once told me. Well, thank you, uh, Greg and Becky and Brian. I appreciate being invited to be able to send a message to everyone uh, with you tonight. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Um, I'll actually be in Ireland, and that is the setting, obviously, for some of the work we've been doing. Um, I first came across this uh, the school that you're going to see in some of the clips, St. Declan's School in Dublin. Uh, it's here by chance. Um, it happened to be the 50th anniversary of this Jesuit um, elementary school, or what they would say a primary school. And as I got to know the school, I understood that it was a school for children with emotional, behavioral, and some learning challenges. And I wanted to go visit and see if it really reflected the Jesuit ethos of cure personalis, or care for the whole person. And it certainly did. And I thought there's a story here that should be told in terms of how the, uh, the Jesuit um, ethos is actually reflected in the practice between these teachers and the children, some of whom have really had a difficult time in mainstream or what we would call general education. And while my colleagues at LMU would say I'm a big advocate for inclusive education, I want all children together, sometimes the general education uh, class and, and school is not ready for these children. And so St. Declan's was an opportunity for these children to have a little time away to be able to have some of their needs addressed and to be able to increase their self-confidence and also be able to work with the schools where they would return so that these children could learn to be successful. So fortunately I was able to uh, talk to Greg Rezin and uh, encourage him to come over and that's when this whole project uh, began and we both immersed ourselves in the school. So I'm, I'm pleased that you'll be able to see some of the interactions both with the, the students, with among the students themselves and also between the teachers and the students. Um, I think it's a very personal and as I said, care for, uh, care for the whole person. While we were there, we noticed that there was a chair um, in the um, in the school that was called the magic chair. And so this is not a title that Greg and I came up with. But it was actually um, a chair that was referred to by both teachers and the students there as a chair where students could go and actually have some time to reflect, some time to be quiet. Um, sometimes the teacher would suggest that this was a place for the, the child to go. But it took on this notion of, of being transformative, of a chair or a place or a space where these children could actually experience some trans transformation, both personally and with their, uh, their um, other friends in the school and with the teachers and so forth. So Greg and I thought that the magic chair would, was also a great metaphor uh, for transformation. And so what we're trying to do with the project through both the film and the transmedia project is really talk about transformation. But transformation so that uh, these students with disabilities, these students with challenges who are often rejected by their peers, by their teachers, by general society, um, could really start to show their strengths, their talents, what is really something positive about what they have to contribute. And I think by seeing some of these children and the interviews and so forth, you'll get a sense really of what are some of the strengths of these students. And that's really the notion of the whole transmedia project is to provide a space, an opportunity for individuals with disabilities to tell their own stories. Um, there's a phrase within the disability community, nothing about us without us. And so the, the uh, transmedia project is really to enable individuals to tell their stories as well as families, teachers, and so forth. So I hope you enjoy the presentation tonight. Again, I'm sorry I can't be there with you, but um, I look forward to hearing all about it. Thanks very much. Believe it or not, she did that in one take. <laughs> As a film, anybody who's made films knows what I mean by that, right? Is that Skype? Is that this was Skype, yeah. Looks she good. just Skyped with her and recorded it. You know, that's a great thing. People really can know. I don't know anybody who has a laptop, you know, you can do a screen recording. And I've been recording 
My family members don't tell them this for years <laughs> on Skype. They don't know it. I have all these great conversations with my parents someday. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, but no, Vicki is interesting. She tells a story there about how she discovered it. And what, what she doesn't mention is how she brought me there. So she caught me when I was really, really low. <laughs> I had just finished the film that Brian mentioned, Lost Child, and I was just really exhausted from making that film. And Vicki had come to a screening of that film um, at the, that was a joint venture between the School of Ed and the School of Film and Television. And we had a sort of premiere cant screening here on campus. And, she came and uh, she had known of the school, had been trying to figure out what to do with the school. How do you tell the story of the school? And she came and saw this documentary that I had made about my sister and her story. And she thought, oh, well, maybe a movie, maybe a film about this school would be the answer. Um, so that started a long conversation. And she invited me to come to Dublin and see the school. Now, at the time my son was five months old, I'd never left him. And the thought of going there and going away and it was kind of exciting but scary at the same time. So I agreed and I remember flying, it was in May, and I, it was in May of 2011 now, a couple years down the road from when she discovered the school. And uh, I flew over to Dublin and I remember flying all night, you have to leave here in the morning, arrive there Monday morning in Dublin, and Vicky meets me at the airport and she says, let's go to the school. <laughs> God, I just flew all night. We're driving through the rain and I'm thinking, what the heck am I doing here? Like, there are great stories right around the corner from where I live. I just spent six years doing one documentary and had vowed I would never make another one. And here I am in Dublin, you know, going to a school. And I remember we pull up to the school in the cab and we jump out and we run to the door through the rain. There's a big blue door. You saw it in one of the pictures. And we're standing there. She rings the bell and uh, I'm standing there. And I look in the window of the school, and there's a little drawing. It's a little drawing of a tree with a little cabin underneath it, a kid's drawing. And I've seen thousands now. But at the time, I remember looking at the drawing and thinking, wow, that's kind of neat. And then the door opened, and we stepped inside. And now, those of you who know me, Brian and Becky know me very well, and some of you in the room as well, I, I may not be the most sort of openly spiritual person or the most openly like devoted to the higher uh, <laughs> High, higher persons, whatever shape that may take for you. But I walked in, and there was something that moved. I kind of remember physically not, like, I walked in, and suddenly I'm like, wow, there's something happening here. You could feel it in the place. I mean, you could feel it, that something about this place was special. And we spent a week there. We did not have permission to film. We were this, just there to meet people and to see the school. Vicky just wanted me to, to meet the school. And I left there a week later like, well, I know what movie I'm making next. There's, <laughs> there's no doubt about it. It was one of those things, experiences you have as a filmmaker where you're like, this is something I have to follow. There's something happening here that, that I've not experienced before in my life. And the fact that it was in Ireland made it both appealing. It's kind of exotic, but it's in English. There's a number of things about it that are <laughs> going to work, hopefully, for the film. But it also made it very, very difficult to be making a film so far from home. Right? A lot of challenges came from making a film so far from home. So we'll get into some of those uh, now as we go through the presentation. But as Vicki intimated, what began after that first trip was, a, was, a, was a, a discussion about what are the goals? What are we trying to do? You know, is it just telling this story of a school or is there something bigger to the goal? Is there something broader that we're going for? And uh, so that was in 2011 when I went and uh, she and I decided to partner on the project. And, and I kind of felt it was one of those inevitable partnerships. Like once I had met this place and met this woman who wanted so passionately to tell the story of this place, then, uh, then I was, you know, I got caught hook, line, and sinker, as they say, fishing, right? I don't think you can say no to Vicky. <laughs> no, you can't. anybody who knows Vicky, you can't say no to Vicky. That's true. So over this year of 2011, we started brainstorming. What do we do? How do we tell the story? Is a traditional documentary the thing to do? And I had been grow having a growing interest in something called transmedia. How many of us know this word transmedia or have heard this word? So some of us, it may be a flavor of the month thing, it may be a word that's come and gone, right? It sort of was in vogue for a while. Is it still yeah, in vogue? Still, around. still gets, gets, gets used. But it's sort of, you know, when Vicki and I began to articulate the goals, from her point of view, she's like, look, this is an opportunity. This is one story. And I was like, yeah, but maybe we want to tell more than one story. Maybe we should try to find a way to do a project that tells the story of the school, but also begins to open up the possibility for other stories. I had really been involved in, in Lost Child, the film I made with my sister. I had stumbled upon a new way of making films for myself, which is 
I really wanted to try to make a film. Because I started studying. I had been researching that script. I'd been writing a script about brothers and sisters for a decade, failing. And then somebody said, why don't you just do an interview with your sister the next time she comes to visit LA? That was in 2004, and I did that interview, and it grew into a film, right? It grew into a documentary that I made with and about my sister. And that was when I started researching how individuals with disabilities have been portrayed in the media, and the answer is badly. We're doing better now, but most of the time, put the person in the wheelchair in the corner, point a camera at them, and oh, look, it's a big pity party. And I was like, that is BS. We gotta do something different. And so I started making this film with my sister. I said, I want to try to make a film about disability from the inside looking out, rather than from the outside looking in. And then this project became a further opportunity to explore that. And so this film that we ended up making is really, which we'll see parts of tonight, and hopefully the film will be finished soon, the film is really trying to tell the story of these children by having them tell their own stories. And the original concept, I tried to get 60 cameras donated. I was going to give every kid in the <laughs> school a camera, and they would film it themselves. Didn't end up working out that way, but they all did participate in the making of the film, and we're going to see some of their work in a few moments. But this idea of transmedia, which I'm going to let Becky define because she's better at it than me, became another way for us to expand the goal of the project, which was really to empower individuals with disabilities to tell their own stories, right, and to provide a place for those stories to be seen and heard. The beautiful thing is we went very early on, Vicki and I, to meet John Kerala, and we said, we need a website, and we need support for this, and he said yes, and LMU has pledged to provide support for that website in perpetuity. And we'll see, uh, we'll see a look at that website in a few minutes because it launches in, in January of next year. So, Becky, what is Transmedia anyways? <laughs> so Transmedia is kind of a flavor of the month. Um, it's been called a lot of different things, cross-platform media, uh, multimedia. The basic idea is that you tell a story using many pieces across different media. Um, we no longer only watch television, or only see movies in the theater, or only listen to the radio, unless you're Mary McCullough, and then you only listen to NPR. Right. Um, <laughs> you and I are on the same page, Mary. You know I liked um, you for a reason. <laughs> um, people consume media across devices, across platforms. Um, you might watch a television show, but then also read about the show online. You might get little pieces of information about what's coming up next season through social media. Um, things get peppered across different media. Um, it's kind of natural for uh, younger people, right? For kids, teenagers. Um, and some of us adults are, are kind of adept with it. Um, but it's a really wonderful way of telling stories because you don't have to make a feature film. You can make a two minute uh, video. Um, you can do a 10-second Snapchat and still tell a story. There are lots of different modalities, which syncs really nicely with the idea of um, universal design um, and making accommodations for people who have all different types of abilities. Great. So we, when we went down this road of like, wow, let's maybe do a transmedia project, I started researching this area, and there's this great Canadian, the National Film Board of Canada. If anybody is interested in sort of sort of newer media, immersive media, transmedia world, go to the National Film Board of Canada website. They're, they're, they're funding some really beautiful things, but I'm not Canadian, darn it. So, um, but we made up, we figured out the only way you start to strategize this is you make what's called a transmedia map. So this ends up being our transmedia map for the project, right? So if you notice, the documentary up here is only one small part of this much larger project. And so the title for the film which we're coming towards, and I think we'll end up using, is the closer to me, I and mean, that plays a role in the, in the documentary. But that is only one small piece of this much larger project. So many different audiences, people with disabilities, families and friends, teachers and paraprofessional educators, basically, and the general public. And then all of these different pieces that come into being. So, uh, Becky, do you want to talk a little bit about, about them? Um. I will say this is our second, our, our map 2.0. The first map, 2 I think, looked a lot like Dublin, where everything's kind of spread out and it's cow packs. Um, so we've tried to clean it up into something a little bit more um, linear here. Um, so like I was saying, the, the trick with transmedia is that you tell these stories across all different platforms. I don't know what happened with our S there, but um, we're hoping that YouTube and Instagram and some of these uh, 
blog sites and Twitter and Medium and places where people are already living um, can be fed into our website so that we can curate a really robust set of stories. Um, we're not limiting what people can submit by a type of disability. There are some online communities out there that are just for people with autism, for example. We want to hear stories from everyone, and we want people to be able to define themselves and their experiences however they would like. Um, so we're trying to give them as many media as we can, um, and then a wide prompt for creating things. Um, so we have places for blog posts. We're hoping to create some resources for educators. Um, around how you make these stories, how you tell stories, probably some things around um, universal design and how to better serve uh, children with disabilities. Um, we're hoping to do lots of social media. We've talked about doing web series. Um, and then the piece that I'm really excited about are these storytelling workshops, um, which gets us into K-12 schools, um, which uh, you know is directly related to what the film did um, and has accomplished. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about those when we get to it in the timeline. Um, and then we have this really exciting partnership right now with the M School here at LNU and some really wonderful students who have been creating really exciting and mind-blowing experiences for us, which again, we'll come back to. So Transmedia Map, it's constantly evolving, but you get to see the complexity. Now when I, you know, making a film is hard. I knew making the film was hard. I had no idea about this stuff. Right, and I guess part of being a university professor and maybe one of the advantages of making or trying to launch a transmedia project here uh, and in higher ed is I've been able to reach out to a lot of people around the university to talk about how do you do this, how do you do that, partnering here, meeting Becky in the School of Ed, working a bit with some folks in School of Science and Engineering, working with the M School and the School of Business. So you really realize that to do something like this, it can't only be housed in the school film television. We, we're the, maybe the core content creators, but in the future, or in the world we live in now, you gotta be playing in all these arenas, right, if you really wanna capture audience. So our transmedia map. So moving on to 2012, what happened in 2012? We started really going down the road of what kind of documentary to make. You know, there's lots of different kinds of documentaries. There are documentaries with people sitting down and talking to the camera. There are more immersive uh, cinema verite style documentaries. We just started really grappling with what is the concept going to be. And I went over to the school and shot for a couple films to change the way you think about it and talk about things. I'm going to a school to shoot pictures of kids. Ah, I mean, so I've been trying to change my, my way of speaking. So it's all filming now, although that's problematic too because we don't use film. I don't know what we say anymore. We're just taking a camera and lens it. Um, <laughs> But we're in a school with a camera, right? So what kind of documentary? We spent a lot of time researching that. We had to raise some money and we ran an Indiegogo campaign. Anybody know what crowdfunding is? That's sort of a thing that we've done. And I have to say, if you've ever done it, it's a full-time job. I don't know if I'd ever do it again, but we raised enough money through the Indiegogo campaign to, to start uh, putting the project together. Uh, more transmitter research and planning, really trying to figure out what we wanted to do there, what impact we wanted to have. We started looking for Irish partners, right? And what I mean by that is not just at the school. We had to obviously get the school on board, the, the principal, and, uh, but the main thing was the parents. So I went to Ireland, I believe it was three times, just to meet with parents at the school. It took us 18 months to get into the school with a camera. One of the things I learned when I was over there, having grown up with a sister with a disability, having spent a lot of time watching my parents struggle with that, um, it really felt, and I don't mean this in any negative way about Ireland, but Ireland felt a little bit behind us somehow in dealing with this issue. In those three visits, I never met a father. I only met the mothers. And it was really strange. We, there, we even took my film, Lost Child, which I had, one of the concerns a lot of the parents had was like, well, here you are, these people from Hollywood who want to come to, <laughs> they think we're from Hollywood, because no shit is it, there. So who, who are you and why do you want to come to our school and point cameras at our kids, right? It was a really difficult thing to negotiate. So at one point, Vicki and I were like, well, let's take, get all the parents together and show them your own film. You're in it, your parents are in it, your sister's in it, they can see that you handled that story with dignity and respect. And even that wasn't enough to get us over the 80%. We roughly only had about 80% buy-in from the parents, even after all that work. But I was really, really dead set on this. This was one of my primary things. I, I wanted every 
child in the school to play a role in the film. I didn't ever want to have to say, you know, Alex, you can't be in the film, I'm sorry. You know, I never wanted to have to have that conversation with a kid. So we were grappling with how do we, how do, we do that? What do we do? And together we came up with this idea like, well, the school had this really neat tradition of every year, the school's a small school, only about 60 students, that they make a big project of some kind as a school. The year before, they'd all written a book, and it was, and this is one of the advantages of a small country, it was, they printed it at the National Ar Ar Archives, whatever, I can't remember all, but they ended up like, you know, making this book and, and going to the houses of government and presenting it, I mean, all kinds of stuff. But they had this tradition of a book or, or of an art project every year, and I thought, well, then that's what we do. Let's teach the kids to do an make animated films. And then every child in the school can participate in the making of this film because the animated films will be part of the film, right? Because I wanted every child to play a role in the film. And so that's what we ended up doing. So then we had to figure out how to teach animation, <laughs> how we had to buy equipment to take to the school, leave behind so they could do this work. But it all worked out very well. And every child did have a role in film. And now we're going to watch a little video where they, where they show us a little bit about what they did. So this is one of the, we're going to watch two short videos that were, were cut and edited by Bella, our RAINS research assistant, and this is one of them. These will be featured on the website when it goes live. Are we ready? One, two, three. The Magic Chairs! So, I'm imagining, just for a minute, that this chair is a character in a cartoon. So, super chair and his sidekick, the stool. <laughs> so, I think you know a lot about cartoons. Yes. Yes. So, today we are going to be doing some claymation. Okay, so I'm going to hold it down and you need to stick the four legs onto the bottom of the chair. In the story that I remember that stuck out to me the strongest last time was that chairs hate being sat on. So they said, oh, we're going to start standing up for ourselves. And then take a picture of one and then put the basketball up in his hand, one, so you can just go the basketball down, basketball up. <laughs> Put up, so I think maybe we'll yeah. move it down. It's a bit ugly, that. Oh. And now we're going to put them like this then. Like that? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> cool. It doesn't magically appear. It's great, isn't it? Right. Are we happy with that? Yeah. No. I am crazy. He comes in and then just turns his head. Slowly towards the camera. Oh, oh my god, he's so scary! Jeremy saw a sad boy called Rex. And said, let's be sad together. Come have a rest. Oh yeah, that's good. And you saving it? You've done half a second. Uh, yeah, I can't see his um, sword. You can't see the sword? Okay. Wait, oh, oh yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> You don't have power. So I'm gonna give you power. It could be laser eyes or it could be shape shifting. You could turn into a mouse. He can do it. Very good. He worked as a team from start to finish, and here was our home. We have each other. So what you're seeing there is some of the work, that, some of the example of the work that was done by the students. So 
uh, we sculpted, the, we, we kind of developed this idea of like, well, let's teach them how to make animated films, work with the teachers in the school to find a theme, and they chose the magic chair on their own. That was not our, that was not our, God, you know, they could have done whatever they wanted. And they chose, they knew we were interested in the magic chair, though, so they said, okay, all the short films that they made have a magic chair in them except for one. Darn them. And, uh, but, uh, so that was a little bit about that. So we'll get, we're going to keep moving on here because time is of the essence. So we'll kind of get up to the present as soon as we can. So 2013, 2014, what happened then? Uh, we began to film at the school. So what did we do there at the school? We filmed for 60 days at the school with two cameras. Uh, and you saw Neve, this is young. Uh, yeah, how do you pronounce this? Irish is a very strange language. Neve, that's Neve. Well, yeah, you know Alex, you're a librarian. Of course you know. The rest of us look at that, and I'm like, yeah, I don't know. No, so that was Neve, and you saw Neve. Neve was, was the young woman teaching the, um, the students how to do animations. It was really fascinating. I, I had stumbled across her. We kind of reached out. I was going to come do some filming at the school, and I needed somebody to do sound for me. And so I got connected to her through an Irish filmmaking network. And then it turns out she's a very talented young had just received her MFA from the Galway, uh, from the John Houston School in Galway. And so we started working with her. She would work for me every time I went over there. And then eventually, uh, we were not able to write, no, my original plan was brilliant. I was going to leave LMU, go to Dublin for nine months, and shoot at the school for two days a week, and edit for two days a week, and hang out for three days a week. Didn't work out. <laughs> Raised enough money, really, to only hire Neve. So I struck a really great deal with her. She's never made a feature like the documentary before, but I said, hey, listen, you live 10 minutes from this school. Let me teach you the aesthetic we're going for. Let me teach you a little bit about how to make films, and then you can be one of the primary uh, filmmakers. And so she has a co-director credit. But it turned out we're sitting around one day riffing on Skype about this idea of animation, and I was struggling at to how we made that happen. She said, Oh, I teach animation workshops, Greg. <laughs> to underprivileged youth in Galway. And I'm like, holy shit, you're an angel. <laughs> so we hired her to do that, too. So that was really a challenge, because now she's filming and conducting workshops and trying to film herself conducting workshops. Because I couldn't get over that. It was a bit nutty. But we filmed for 60 days over the 2013-2014 school year. And during that time, it was when Becky joins the team. I can't even quite remember how we met, but uh, I ex put double exclamation points, because in my mind, the transmedia stuff, I had a sense of it, but it wasn't very knowable. It wasn't a, word, a world I'd done anything in. And Becky had, and so she joined the team, and, and uh, we've been moving forward together and having a great time. 2015, jump ahead. So we film, we film, we film, and then what do you do? And this is where I'm going to ask Brian to come up for a minute, because <laughs> Brian and Bella join the team. Right? Brian, come on up and talk if you can for just a couple minutes about what does that even mean, documentary post production? Maybe lay out for these, for this group, the the challenges you face, and also, yeah. You know. So, uh, Greg and I met uh, and talked about the film in August of 2015, and uh, and uh, at first, you you told me you didn't think this may be a feature. You said, "I think I have enough for a 40-minute film," and I said, "Okay, let's take a look at the footage." and there was uh, about 160 hours of footage, so <laughs> we, we decided to, to move forward trying to make a feature film. So the, the first step uh, had actually already been done. Uh, Bella, as the Reigns assistant, had gone through and logged all of the footage into a several hundred page spreadsheet uh, listed by time code and keyword listed so that we could search that document as things went through. But then uh, one of the first steps for the editors then to set up the project and actually watch all of the footage. So the first five months, five months, because uh, we, I was working on it part time, was uh, just watching the footage. And I said, okay, we'll talk in a couple months, uh, and we did. And so the 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 next step is sort of picking your selects and uh, starting to cull that 160 hours down to uh, we were aiming for an 80 minute cut. So the first cut was 10 hours long. Um, <laughs> that was all of, we said, let's, tr let's try and just see you know, every moment that we think we want to include in the film. And um, what we found in, in cutting it down was um, Greg had a very distinct vision that he, he had shot interviews to be used for the website, but he did not want them to be included in the film. Uh, he wanted the film to be not just about the children, but of the children and, and on the children's level. So um, that 
was an approach to documentary I'd never done before. I don't think you'd ever done before either. So uh, we took our 10 hours and then started trying to figure out, okay, uh, the next process is how do we write this into a story? And I would say the first six months was a lot, at least for me, a lot of trying to impose a story on the children. So it was, okay, let's see if we can find uh, somebody who was really troubling at the beginning and then at the end, magically, they're, they're better. That's, that's not the case um, for the school. They, they improve, but nobody, there's, there's no uh, cure-all for what these children are dealing with. So then we had to find small stories that had large impact, which is where we've been going throughout the film. And um, luckily, they did shoot those 60 days over the course of a school year. So there was a narrative framework to work off of. Um, but we, we've definitely struggled. There's, uh, if I had to guess, probably 15 main characters in the film, which is a lot, um, and trying to balance them and keep the audience oriented as to who's who and um, keep that story going has definitely been a, a, a fun struggle. So we're, we've gotten to the point that uh, this past summer we did a screening of a uh, cut of the film. Oh, I'm jumping in. I jumped the slide. Good. No, that's good. Uh, but let's go. There it is. Okay. Test screening. So, so we, we did our first major test screening and uh, got some really good feedback. Overall, um, our 80-minute cut did everything we really wanted it to. The, the major feedback that we got was everybody felt they were getting to know the students really well, but not so much the teachers. So we're in the stage of re-editing right now and trying to utilize audio from some teachers' interviews to kind of provide commentary on what their methodology is and also what their feelings are as they're dealing with some pretty intense situations and allow that to broaden the experience for the viewer a little bit. But uh, we're, we're nearing the finish line. We're nearing the finish line. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Hopefully it's not a train, as they say, right? <laughs> so, um, but no, Brian, what Brian didn't mention there is something I will. It's a devious thing that directors do. One of the tools we use as directors is called misdirection. We do it quite often. It's a, and bullfighters do it. You know, bullfighter has this red thing over here. The whole goal is to get somebody to look over there and then stab them in the back. We do that as film directors a lot. <laughs> Sometimes within the frame, we don't stab people in the back. I'm sorry. That. But, but Brian, you know, he had one idea. It's just sort of a funny story. He had one idea. He'd done a lot of films where he would do what's called a radio edit, you know, lay down a voiceover and things that sort of sculpt the, the, the narrative trajectory of the movie. And I didn't want to do any of that. We had talked about that briefly, but he, you were really committed to trying that. So I was like, go for it, dude. He spent a couple of months trying that. I knew we didn't have the footage to do that. I didn't think we did. But after a couple of months of letting Brian struggle, we, you know, we got together and said, Let's, what we really want to try to do is make the film immersive. So the whole goal that I had, one of the challenges with the film was, I just said, I just want people to show up at the school and have the experience that I did when I was there. And that's what we've been trying to replicate in the film, this idea of the experience that I had when I walked into that place and, and, and felt that movement for the first time. And so that's why we were trying to do that in a way where you don't explain anything. And that's one of the things we also experiment with as filmmakers, is how long can I get, how long can I have an audience hang on before I have to start giving them answers, before I have to start giving them signposts about what this film is about, about what they're supposed to be following. And so uh, we did a test screening in, in, in June. It was a pretty typical test screening in that we got extreme, extreme feedback. One person saying, don't change a frame, and another person saying, oh my god, you've got to go back to the beginning. And uh, they were actually husband and wife, so that's a pretty strange, <laughs> wondering how their lives work out like, when they're doing that. But, but that is one of the, the, the nature of making films and putting them in front of people as works in progress is that you learn about the film you're making and what we came out of those test screenings with. And uh, I know, Ray, you have everybody's email address of who's here, right? Because we'll be doing another test screening later this year, and if you guys are interested, we'll make sure we send the invitation your way um, because we hopefully have solved the, the narrative challenges that people were having. The feeling people had at that test screening was like, wow, we love the immersive nature. We love feeling like we're part of the school. We just want some more context and a bit more emotional connection with the teachers as well. So 
that's part of being a filmmaker, though, is you have to respond to the work in progress. So, okay, so thank you, Brian. Stay up here. Uh, don't go away. I can probably come back in a sec. So, in 2015, Brian and Bellick began transmedia strategizing, meaning we really started getting into it, making decisions about what we were going to do, starting to look for a web designer, starting to develop a web page, and all those things that are sort of at the core of the transmedia part of this project. Luckily, we found a great partner and a guy named uh, Simon Hinchliff, who lived in LA at the time, has since left, but he's a very talented web designer who sort of understood uh, that we didn't have a lot of money, that we would be kind of making this project over time, but he's really been a great, great partner. You're going to see some of his work right now, because the website has been designed, and we've been strategizing how and when to launch, and do we launch at the same time, as the movie is released and different kinds of things, right? So we're trying different strategies. And so, how do I go to full screen here? Little green dot. Oh, a little green dot. I hit that green dot and it goes full screen? Are you serious? All these years, I have no idea. <laughs> Who told me that? Who? Thank you, Jamie. Holy <laughs> mackerel. I always wondered what that green dot was. <laughs> magic. It's magic. It's magic. So, that, I, met, I know that one. That one I could probably get. But no, so here's the website. So you begin to see sort of how it's functioned. What's, what's interesting about this is that we had to dive deep into the accessibility side of website design. Yeah. You know, because here you're making a film about disability, I mean, a website and a project about disability. Well, they better be able to access, access it. So um, all kinds of different things. And this is, this is the website that will go live um, in January. And, it's really about getting, having opportunities for people to share their own stories. So people will be able to submit community videos, you know, people will be able to um, submit photos. Oh, oh that's us. I even get, don't need us. Where am I going? I'm, trying to, I'm sorry, I'm showing you all the boring stuff. How do I get home? See, what, so all this stuff is linked to our Facebook page and our Twitter and, and uh, what is that one, Vic, Becky? Instagram. That's Instagram, okay. You can tell I'm, I'm of the last generation. Um, but the website is, you know, working with Simon has been really an eye-opening thing because this is a website that's designed to capture and allow people to contribute. I've done some website design before where it's all about pushing information out. Those are really easy. Suddenly you dive into something like this, much more difficult proposition, right? On the legal front as well as on the technical front because we're dealing with children. You know, we're dealing with... Um, tricky issues, right? We're dealing with things that carry a lot of stigma for many, many people in the world. And uh, as Becky mentioned earlier, it's really, really important uh, when we launch this site, um, there will be no way for somebody to say, oh, I want, well, I want to sell, well, how do I even say this? We didn't want to have these categories of, oh, pull down menu with, oh, here's, here's physical disability, here's autism, here's dyslexia. Here. One of the problems is that people once you're labeled, once you're diagnosed, that's sort of this thing that sticks with you forever. Right? So we're trying to get away from this idea of asking people to label themselves. Now, we were told by doing research, you know, we do research when you do stuff. That people are like, well, they're going to come and want to search. If I have a kid with dyslexia, I'm going to come to your site and I'm going to want to search for the videos and for the photos and for the stories that have to do with dyslexia. So we had to build in a way for you to search for those things, but they aren't called out explicitly on the site, right? It's very, very important for us. And so this is a good thing for us to see the website coming along and um, getting ready to launch. It's been great working with Simon, but it's been quite a challenge. So let's see, oh, that doesn't work. Now we're going down. Okay, now I'm using the clicker. Now I need the red button. Now I need the red button. But you can see, okay. <laughs> but this, so we'll have all kinds of things. You know, we're going we're gonna to have bloggers that we, we uh, sort of have a relationship with. We'll be featured bloggers and once a month or once every other month we'll commission stories about certain things. So one of our big challenges is finding a community manager and raising enough money for a community manager to help us pay to keep this site going once we launch it. Okay. Uh oh. Then, you gotta go back to your presentation. then I go back to my presentation. Thank you for <laughs> the directions. <laughs> So this is the big thing we've come up against. We realize once we launch this, this is one of our big challenges going forward, is like, how do you feed the beast? Once we launch this thing, people need to be writing, we need to be curating, we need to, you know, I mean, once we launch it, we have to have some volunteers and another range research assistant, some other people to help us keep it going. 
Um, as Becky mentioned, we have some current partnerships going with the M School here in, uh, at LMU in this campus, and we've done two projects with them now. Uh, Becky mentioned they're doing a VR uh, workshop now, so they're doing a VR experience for, our, for the project. And then uh, this last summer, I taught a film class uh, in, in Paris through film, and we in Paris, and we had the student groups do a short film through the lens of somebody with a disability. So we assigned four groups to four different neighborhoods. They had to go there and figure out what film they wanted to make, what story they wanted to try to tell uh, through the lens of somebody with a disability. So we're trying to hit people in college. We've done work with the Wish Charter School here with the fourth graders a couple years ago. We had a, a, a storytelling project with them. So in addition to sort of the film, in addition to the website, we've been trying to do some community work as well and reach out to different folks. Our current activities, editing continues, stay tuned, and uh, one last little video and then we'll be done and have time for questions. So here's a little video from the, with the magic chair. Uh, one of the things we mentioned that we had 60 days and two cameras. One of the things we did is we had one camera we'd be wandering around the school doing sort of traditional documentary filmmaking, observational documentary filmmaking. But every time we were at the school, we would set a second camera up in front of the magic chair because it just sits there. Because you never had any idea who was going to sit there, when, or whatever. So you just run this camera all day in front of this chair. It was my job to log all those things because Bella said, I don't want to do that, Greg. I'm like, OK. So 40 hours of the magic chair I watched. And it was harrowing to watch all of those. And uh, the magic chair plays a big role in the film. It's one of the consistent threads that we come back to. And what quite often you felt when you watched that footage is you were watching moments that you were not supposed to see. Like they were private moments that, that nobody should have witnessed. And they really, it was, remember Brian, I was logging those while you read it. It was really hard to log some of that footage. So Bella put together a little video for us. We're gonna watch this as the last thing we watch. And then we have hopefully a little time left for There it is. to the cameras, but when they have a big notice that says, hey, this is on, it's, like, <laughs> it's just a different story. Do you want to sit down for another few minutes and do you think then you're probably nearly ready to go back up, do you think? Hmm? What do you think, Matthew? Yeah. You're feeling a bit better and you, you've taken my advice. You're not going to let anyone annoy you. You're not going to give them the satisfaction. It's annoying you, is it? Well, it's itchy. I've been itching it for two weeks. You had a fall? Yeah. Yes. I you poor thing. Now, Sean, I won't charge you for that water. That's free on the house. I'm still going to have a problem with money with my leg. I'll give you another one free. Yeah. Your mum is on there. Your mum is on the phone. Off you go. I got it. Yeah, I need you to have a two-second check of this. Thank you. Hey, bye, Sharon. See you tomorrow. Now, we, um, for, for, this, uh, for this video, um, Bella and Brian and I worked, uh, we deliberately kept it light. <laughs> um, but there are some moments in the chair that are, are pretty quite, very difficult to watch. And one of the challenges we've had in making the film is balancing. We want to be really honest and authentic about what happens at the school, because what happens at the school is quite difficult. So that's been one of the challenges of balancing that. And, and um, there's a lot of humor in the movie, but there's a lot of, a lot of really difficult things uh, when you see young children uh, struggling. So any questions or comments? Please. Well, she can go first. <laughs> so, um, my question is kind of something that's been threaded through here, which is the privacy issues and the ethical issues of what you show and what you don't show. And I'm just curious what kind of agreements that you had with the parents and the people who ran the school and what kind of control they had over the stories and how you portrayed the children and that sort of thing. 
Yeah, very good question because you know, any child, you know, I have a child, seven year old child. If somebody said, I want to bring your camera into your son's school and follow them around, I'd be like, why? What are you doing? And what are you going to do with that image? Um, and so those are big questions why it took us almost two years to get in the, the school. Um, so every parent uh, whose son or daughter is in the film had to sign a release saying, I recognize that my, my son is going to be or my daughter is going to be in the school. Not every parent would. And I'll tell you a, fun, a story one time. When we were there, we'd screen Lost Child. It was crazy. Afterwards, uh, uh, the film, which is in the library here, so if you look me up, they have a DVD. You can check it out and see that film um, if you want to see some of my earlier work. But this woman, you know, she was there and she was one of the, she'd come to all three meetings we'd have as the parents. And she was the one who was most firmly against, she said, I don't, I'm not sure I want my kid in this class, in this film. And she said, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a story. I said, okay. Now, Irish are really great storytellers. I don't know what it is about that island, but man, you spend time there. They all are great storytellers. She starts telling me a story. Well, you know, I was at the dentist the other day, Greg, and uh, I was, my dentist asked me, you know, how's, how's my family doing? And uh, I told him that, I told him I had to send my son to St. Declan's. I had to send my son to St. Declan's. And I thought, wow, okay, that's interesting. And then she went on. She says, and when she told me that, I didn't want her to be my dentist anymore. Because she said, I had, the dentist had said, I had gone to St. Declan's. She said, oh, I went there for two years. And the woman was like, I don't want you to be my dentist anymore. Oh, I'm sorry, I blew that story. I told her, man, I'm bad at jokes. I got it backwards. No, so what happens, I, she tells the story. She, her dentist said, I went there. It's a great thing. Your son will get the help he needs. And she was just not seeing it. And so the parents have always said, we're, we've not, they've not seen the film yet. It's going to be quite difficult when we go over there and show the film, and hopefully they'll feel we handled it properly. But we were very clear with them that we we're not going to shy away from showing some of the things that are difficult in the school, because otherwise it's a puff piece that doesn't really accurately reflect the reality of these children and their, and their lives. As Brian mentioned, one of the things that's interesting about the film is not about one of the our audiences he, seem to want to meet a kid, see them struggling, healed at the end. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen at that school. It doesn't happen for many people with disabilities, right? This is the reality they have to accept and live with. It doesn't mean they can't grow and get stronger and, and the school does beautiful work to help the students. But they're not cured. And so I think when audiences ask for that, they're not going to be happy with this movie because we're not going to give that to them because we can't. It's not truthful. So, um, I have a question too. Um, I, I was wondering, Greg, if, if one of the ways to feed the beast might be by creating some sort of interdisciplinary course where LMU students from different disciplines on all the entities that are involved in the project might be able to get together and you know, have students working on that. Yeah. Uh, I think there's, there's, we, we've got to think of other ways to do it because that's one of the challenges I've realized is that this kind of project you know, we have a, some of you guys know, how many people know Glenn Gephardt? Anybody know him? A lot of us, right? You know, so Glenn is a faculty member of School of Film and Television who's made, I asked him how many films he's made in Cuba, and he said, I don't know, I've made so many, I don't know anymore. And I don't think he's lying. But he started joking with me like, so what's happening with your life's work? Because it has become my life's work. And, you know, and then another faculty member said, well, if that's your life's work, it's not a bad thing to spend your life on, and I would agree. Um, I just want to thank you so much for making this film. I grew up with an ASD or an autism spectrum disorder, and my parents were afraid of it. They never told me about it. So I spent my entire life having these social problems, having these physical problems as well, because my disability was kind of physical as well, and I did not know. So this is a great film to bring awareness to those issues, to make people with these disabilities feel accepted. and like they're real people, so thanks. Thank you, no, thank you for saying that. And, and you know, one of the things Vicki likes to talk about, and if she was here, she would say this, you know, that basically by making this project, we've drifted into what she likes to articulate as the, the final human rights struggle. It's really, you know, it's, not, it's, a fine, it's, like, it's like the civil rights struggle. This is the struggle for people with disabilities to live, to be treated as fully human. You know, the, the spectrum of what is normal, that's a word I've become really uncomfortable with in the last 10 years and working in the film about my sister, and working in this project, like, what is normal? I don't, th what's normal is that there's a beautiful spectrum of people on the planet, all who have different, different strengths and different, <laughs> different beautiful things to share with us. And so when we classify somebody as normal, I really have a problem with that. 
And I'll be honest with you, if somebody, if the people want to stick with that, I'm happy to be abnormal. Give me abnormal any day. That's where I want to be. So thank you for that. Any other questions or comments or thoughts? Yeah, please. So Greg, what, like, are these kids, is there an age limit that they have to leave the school? And then what happens to them? Is there any placement or? Yeah, that's one of the unique things. Vicki, uh, I'm sorry she's not here, because she would tell that as far as we know, and she's done more research in this area than I have, St. Declan's is the, the only Jesuit school in the world whose mission is specifically to deal with children with special needs. The only Jesuit school. And the guy who founded it was known for, at the Jesuit residence there in, Ireland, in Dublin, was known for pounding on the table and saying, St. Declan's is the Jesuit school. Right? Because think about it. What did Jesus say? Yeah, go after and help the people who need the help the most. So I think in some ways he was right. Um, but what happens is students come to St. Declan's, the goal, and this, is, this comes out in the film, the goal is not that a student would come there for their whole primary uh, school experience. The goal is to identify some children, a child who has a, a challenge, a problem that, that, that is within the sort of scope of what the school can handle. And the student can come to the school for somewhere hopefully between one to three years, during which time they're brought up, back up to speed academically for where they need to be, and they're taught the skills of how to go back to the mainstream school and thrive. What's interesting, they've been doing it for 60 years, not close to 60. Vicki came across the school at 50. And as part of the interviews, we've interviewed some students who are alumni of the school. And some of the first interviews we did, young people who are very successful, who went to the school for a few years, found a way to deal with their challenges, and went back and have really thrived. And so those stories will be part of the larger web experience. Because in addition to the website you saw here for the Magic Chair project, there will be a film website as well for the film. And at that film website will be interviews with these alumni, interviews with the teachers, interviews with the principals, and all that stuff. So you can hear from some of those young people. The story in that opening little video, like what if you were a daffodil, and, you know, you, you know, that was a story that was told a young guy named Michael Power, who is an alumni of St. Declan's. We met him and we interviewed him, and he told us this awful story. A story about how he'd really been struggling. He was in school, not doing well, and his teacher asked him, his mother, to come visit the school one day. And this woman actually, the, the teacher said to the, his mother, Oh, come over here, I need to look at something on the walkway. And they go out and they look out the window, and there's a line of daffodils growing along the sidewalk that leads up to the school. This is not St. Declan's, this is his normal primary school. And this teacher actually had the nerve to, to, to say to his mother, you see those daffodils? Some daffodils will never bloom. And he said his mother took him out of the school that day. And they found St. Declan's, and when I met Michael Power, he was just finishing his master's degree in psychology, and his goal is to, to open a high school for children with special needs. And when you, if, you, you saw, if you saw the interview, you would have no idea that this young man had had that kind of challenge. But the fact that that teacher had said that to him was a pretty profound moment. When he told us that story, Vicki and I both about fell out of our chairs that, that, that somebody would have the nerve. A beautiful thing, he ran into her. He was on the bus one day. This is just a couple years ago. We're still in touch with him. There was that teacher all those years ago. So he said he, he thought hard about it, and then he did. He followed her off the bus. And he went up to her and he very politely asked, do you remember me? She didn't, and he told, you know, she didn't even remember him, which was a tragedy of part of it. But he went on to tell her his story and she <laughs> apologized. Which is a kind of a nice thing. Uh, any, other, any other questions or comments or? We have time for one more question. All right, the, the powers that be are coming on in. If not, they I cannot to. imagine a, be, a more positive note to leave on the yeah. next story. Um, again, um, so I wanted to thank every presenter that's represented this evening. So, Professor Rosen, thank you. <laughs> thank Steven, you, everybody. Dr. Stevenson and Brian, thank you very much. Um, before we conclude, I did want to point out that we do have plenty of refreshments still available, and there's, a lot of, there's still a lot of fruit left over. Those feedback forms, again, if you want to fill those out and turn those into the plastic box on the counter, we would appreciate that. And a final thank you to the library outreach team that helped, put, that helped plan today's event. That's John, Carol, Ali, Grace, thank you very much. And again, the audience, thank you for coming out tonight. Good night, everybody. And thank you, everybody, and thank you, thank you, Hannon Library, for doing these events. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about the project. So thank you.
to see the film. I know, I can only imagine. Yeah, it's, like, it's, 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 it's hard to watch. I'm going to have to watch it by myself. No. I, know. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for watching. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah. 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 Yeah.